Welcome to Philosophy on the Fringes, a podcast that explores the philosophical dimensions of the strange and the mundane. We're your hosts, Megan Fritz and Frank Cabrera. On today's episode, we're talking about secularism. How should we think about the emergence of secular cultures? What challenges does secularism face today? And can the secular realm exist alongside the sacred? Welcome back to Philosophy on the Fringes. We're so happy to have you back with us today. We're talking about secularism, which is actually a topic that some of you who are on Twitter voted on. We had a poll and we asked you guys to pick between three different topics for our next episode. It was alcohol, secularism, and the city. And alcohol was winning for a while, um, but secularism ended up winning. Uh, I'm sure there's a joke in there somewhere, but I don't feel like uh, thinking it through right now. So we're going to be talking about secularism today. And I guess what we kind of want to start off talking about is, you know, is the topic of secularism actually, does it actually fit the theme of this podcast, which is that we're we're trying to talk about topics that are sort of on the fringe of academic philosophy. So Frank, you have you have some thoughts on this. Um, how it, does this actually fit the theme of our podcast uh, or not? Yeah. So I think on its surface, secularism is a prominent topic in philosophy. That's because people in political philosophy often talk about freedom of religion or separation of church and state. So I think that's that's certainly right uh, that, you, you know, you can see discussions of secularism in, in these contexts. But I think it's also true that like the very concept of secularism goes more or less unexamined even in these sorts of discussions. So even when the political philosopher is advocating freedom of of conscience or freedom of religion or arguing that the state ought not to establish a particular church, uh, the, the, the political philosopher might not really give too many arguments for secularism. They might it's sort of just taken for granted. And I think the reason why this is, is that a lot of political philosophy, at least up until very recently, has been kind of in-house debate between various strands of political liberalism. So what's political liberalism? Well, that's the view, more or less, that freedom is very valuable and that if the state is going to infringe on people's freedom or their liberty, then that needs to be justified. So take, for instance, two prominent political philosophers of the late 20th century, John Rawls, who we talked about before, and Robert Nozick. So they disagreed markedly on a lot of different things, but they're both political liberals broadly construed. Up until you get to the stuff where Rawls talks about economics, he more or less agrees with Nozick that the state shouldn't, you know, establish a church, shouldn't interfere in people's freedom of conscience and and that sort of stuff. So I think the the idea of secularism hasn't really been examined too much uh, on its own terms. I don't think we really see too much discussion of the arguments for and against it or too much analysis of of the concept. So in one sense, it's it's not fringe, like political philosophers will talk about freedom of religion and whatnot. But there's lots more to say about secularism. I think I think this does fit the theme of the podcast. Nonetheless, I think that makes sense if you're thinking of secularism in a political context. I mean, for myself, when I hear the word secular, I don't think about anything political. Yeah. My first thought is just like someone's personal like worldview or disposition or like maybe I don't know like a cultural setting but nothing I don't I don't ever like automatically think of something political but the word secular has changed in meaning quite a bit from its origin um so we kind of want to talk a little bit just about different things we could mean by secular different things that people have meant by secular how we got this term and why it came to mean what it means today. Yeah, let's go back to the beginning, right? Where does this term secular come from? Well, uh, so this is a ultimately derives from a, a Latin term, seculum. What did that mean in Latin? Well, it sort of meant something like uh, a, a stretch of time, an age, an era, an epoch. So, for example, in the, in the Roman Empire, they would celebrate the so-called secular games, 
So that wasn't uh, a party where people were like, woo, we're, we love secularism. Libertine. We hate, we hate, we hate religion. Game. No, it was <laughs> the, the, they would celebrate every hundred years or so, you know, the, the, the fact that the empire was still around. They'd have gladiatorial games and they'd have beast hunts, et cetera. They'd celebrate the so-called secular games, meaning, you know, a stretch of time has passed. A seculum, a seculum has passed. And this is sort of what it, what it meant in Latin. When St. Jerome translated the, the Bible into Latin, he uses this term seculum to mean something like what I just said, like an age or an era or something like that. He uses it in the translation. In the Bible. So uh, the verse is, let the name of God be praised from now and unto the ages. That is in seculum. And terms in existing languages, such as uh, Spanish, the term for century in Spanish is siglo, and that ultimately derives from seculum, right? A stretch of time. But that's not really what it means nowadays. So secular, right? You, you were sort of gesturing at what that was, Megan. So what are we talking about here now? Yeah, well, I want to go back to the seculum really quick, because so the um, Canadian political theorist and philosopher Charles Taylor talks about seculum in its original linguistic context as an, an epoch or time, and compares and contrasts the, the seculum uh, you know, one one kind of time that we exist in normally and observe as just like a continuous uh, and regular passing with what he refers to as the ancient concept of a higher time, which was a kind of realm or existence that existed outside in a way or outside is the wrong term, but kind of alongside secular time, the seculum that one enters into, for instance, when one engages in ritual or some some kind of religious act where one isn't exactly, uh, at least according to the this ancient mindset, isn't exactly acting in, in that era. They might be doing something to harken back to a more ancient time, to uh, a people group that they identify with from like eras past or something like that. Yeah, so, so Taylor talks about all this in his book, uh, A Secular Age. Yeah, and we'll come back to that. I, we have a lot more to say about that because that's probably the most in-depth philosophical treatment of secularism. So we can't go without mentioning that. But right, so today um, when someone says secular, um, we might think that it's, you know, sort of related to like being not religious. I mean, actually, you could mean broadly one of two things when you say secular now you might mean just like religiously neutral mm -hmm. and so you know someone's secular religiously neutral if they're not if they're just doing something that's not related to a particular religion at all or could be appreciated by people from lots of different religions so like erasmus right the the original humanist maybe uh he his work could be understood as secular even though he wasn't like an atheist or anything or you might mean something closer to atheist. You might mean like if, if some event is secular or some person secular, uh, that might mean that like, you know, religion has no place in their life or in this event. And in fact, they're, they're hostile to religion. Yeah, there's a kind of hostility there. Right? So you're, you're gesturing at like a distinction between secular as neutral with respect to all these religions versus secular as kind of hostile to religion. Is that the idea? Yeah, or like, right, uh, secular is neutral between all different worldviews versus secular as like a a success condition is that there's no religious stuff yeah. involved at all. Right. Going back to uh, secularism in the political realm, I think this is a nice distinction that maps on to the different forms of secularism that we find in, say, the United States on the one hand versus, say, France on the other. So the United States might be described as a secular society. It, I think that's an accurate way to describe the United States in one sense, in the sense that the United States uh, attempts to be neutral, or at least ideally, uh, attempts to be neutral with respect to all the different religious traditions that are out there, the no denominations uh, thereof. So th there is the so-called Establishment Clause in the Constitution. Uh, this is the First Amendment. Right. The state cannot establish a church or any state religion. So that, that's um, that. So that arose historically, given the, the, the wide variety of Christian denominations that existed in colonial America. Secularism, neutrality was a, an attempt to deal with a fact of religious pluralism. Uh, but you can contrast that with the experience in France. Right. So France is also described as a kind of secular society, but they have a very different history from the United States. 
So France's sec secularism arose as a kind of way to combat the dominance of French society by the Catholic Church. So the, the so French secularism ends up being a little more hostile to religion. So if you ask you know French people today, like, are, is this a secular society? They'll say yes. And then the sense in which that is is that secularism is part of their civic identity, not in the sense of being neutral, but sort of being kind of skeptical of of the dominance of any sort of um, church or what have you. That kind of origin is part of like the U.S. founding mythos, though, still, right? I mean, the idea that like the original settlers came over to like gain, you know, freedom of worship. I mean, you know, that's certainly not the motivation a lot of them had, but that's something that like is, I don't know, built into, I guess, American mythology. Right. There's a escape, there's escaping persecution or, right. or, or what have you. But I think the, the, the French, I don't know too much about the, the French experience or French politics, but I, I guess like from what I do know is that they they're very skeptical of religion meddling in politics because they're worried about the kind of domination um, by a religious authority. Yeah. Well, they couldn't escape. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then Belgium is something totally different itself, yeah. right? Yeah. So I learned about Belgium recently, which was their their form of secularism or religious pluralism or what have you is very, very strange, I think, for those of us that are more familiar with the American model of secularism. So in Belgium, there are a, a variety of sort of official religions. There's like six or seven. So these include Anglicanism, uh, Catholicism, some other forms of Protestantism, a kind of secular humanism, Buddhism, Islam. And what this means is that if you are a member of one of these officially recognized religions, then you get like funding by the state for your ministers. For instance, the state will pay the salaries of, of the ministers of these officially recognized religions. So not all religions are officially recognized. Buddhism, for instance, until 2023 was not an officially recognized religion, but mm -hmm. but now it is. And so they get like state funding and, and what have you. So I think this is like super interesting and super weird, I guess, from the standpoint of secularism from, from the United States, where secularism means neutrality, right? Well, the, the state's not going to interfere with religious, uh, you know, religious. Well, it means no, not having any state churches, let yeah. alone seven of them. Yeah, right. So it, it, there's a way, there's a sense in what I think the Belgians wouldn't like are describing this way. I think they would say, no, we don't have a state church. But there's a sense in which they have like many established religions. Yeah. And so there's freedom of religion in a kind of positive sense, right? The state helps you, or they give, they provide you opportunities and uh, and resources by means of which to exercise your religion. Whereas the the model in the United States is more of a negative model. It's it's freedom from rather than freedom to, which is the Belgium model. Does that seem like an accurate way of describing it? Yeah, I mean, you might think also in the U.S., like religious people are also skeptical of getting assistance or, or not assistance, obviously, because churches get like tax. Yeah, yeah, so tax exemption. But yeah. like, they, I feel like probably in the U.S., like religious people would be skeptical of the state like promoting there. Um, I don't know. It seems like is this like a tit for tat situation in Belgium? Like if you are promoted by the government, or does that mean that you kind of have to like, you know, like talk? Like, can you not criticize the government? I have no idea. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure at all. I don't. I doubt that that's true. I feel like that's what I would be nervous about. Like, why are you promoting me? Do I have to, you know, can I not, can I not criticize you in my like newsletter or yeah. something? Well, ask some Belgians. I don't know. We, do we know some Belgians? If there's anyone who knows anything about Belgium out there, please let us know how this works. Yeah. So at this point in time, in like, especially in Western nations, most of them, secularism is, is basically assumed. It's mm. like the default. Why? Uh, well, maybe, you know, this this might not echo the causal explanation, but we can give like a reasons explanation for why. There's certainly arguments for secularism. And, you know, I would imagine like a big motivator for Western societies creating or wanting to create secular societies is just sort of like the, the, the tumult and turmoil uh, experienced in like wars of religion across the world. You know, one of the biggest causes of wars probably and you know you can imagine a big motivating factor would be well gosh it would be really nice if all of these people with all these different ideas you know humans these thinking you know apes are going to continue to think and continue to have ideas that diverge from other humans ideas and it would be really great if we didn't have to keep like 
you know, factioning off and starting new tribes or groups or countries every time this happens? How can we just like live peacefully together? Yeah, that's what I think of when I think of uh, why we want this. I think of you know, the wars of religion in, you know, Western Europe in the you know, 17th century, like Catholics killing Protestants, Protestants killing Catholics. And and so this is this is, I think, sort of characterizes the, the Western experience of secularism. But also it is worth noting that uh, India, for instance, has a, a pretty robust secular tradition and they're motivated by similar sorts of reasons. India is a country with many different ethnicities and many different religions. You know, Islam and Hinduism are both very prominent religions. Buddhism. Buddhism right, in India. And the, the argument is we need peace. We need order. Secularism is a great way to secure these things. Secularism is needed for modernity, right? We want to have a robust economy. How do we get that? Well, we need peace and order first. And so we need the state to at least be neutral with respect to the, the various religions that are out there. So that seems like the main argument. We need secularism for peace and order, stability and the like. Mm -hmm. Right. And we should mention that these ideas are not just confined to the philosophy seminar room. We, we can find these ideas out there in the real world. So politicians, for instance, will say this sort of stuff. Here's a quote from the former U.S. President Barack Obama, and he says the following, the religiously motivated must translate their concerns into universal rather than religion-specific values. Their proposals must be subject to argument and reason and should not be accorded any undue automatic respect. So what Obama's talking about here is what uh, the philosopher John Rawls would call a public reason. That is, when you give arguments in the public sphere, you need to make sure your arguments are in purely secular terms. You can, you can appeal to certain values, but those values need to be secular, widely shared values. Things like appeals to freedom or appeals to rights or equality of opportunity, that sort of stuff. You can't make appeals to divine revelation or your specific religious tradition. That doesn't fly in a liberal democracy. So that's kind of like an entirely too brief overview of some arguments for political secularism. We'll talk more about that later on in the episode. But for now, you know, those are th th those are arguments for political secularism. But of course, they're not arguments for individual secularism. They're not arguments for like personal secularism. And I mentioned this earlier that one of the most, um, I mean, probably as far as I know, like the most lengthy, scholarly, in-depth treatment of secularism as like a worldwide phenomenon is a book called A Secular Age by the Canadian political theorist and philosopher Charles Taylor. And this book is monstrous. It's almost a thousand pages long. But it's it's so worth it. In my opinion, it's just I mean, it's one of my favorite reads. You've read the whole thing, right? Yeah. Um. Yes. You listen to it on audiobook, though. For I I listen to part of it on audiobook, but yeah, I've I in in some way I've taken in the entirety um, of its content. And I should mention that I've read some of it. I've I've read 280 pages of it, which is enough to be a book. But I'm still making my way through it. It's really good. Megan recommended it to me. She's like, "You'll love this book." And I I do want to make a plug for it. It's a really good book. I had never heard of it until Megan mentioned it, which is kind of sad. I don't know, like why have I not heard of this book? It's really good. Uh, you know, it weaves together really good theorizing with a, a, a expansive knowledge of history, which is awesome. Foster should do that more. You know where I got that book? Where? I actually got that book from, so people who are in academia will know what I'm talking about, but when a professor, like, when they, like, go to a different job or retire, they always leave behind, like, hundreds of books. Yeah. They don't want to move them. And this is, like, great if you're a grad student. You're, like, awesome. Free books. Uh, and that was one of the free books that I got. I don't remember whose it was. Was it in Madison? Yeah. So someone in Madison was reading that book. Yeah, I don't remember who it was, though. But anyway, yeah, so it's one of my favorite works of philosophy. And, you know, at this point, I've been going on about it. I should tell you what it's about. So what Taylor's trying to do in this book is give a kind of uh, a sort of explanation about how we've come to a point in human history where being secular, either religiously unaffiliated or agnostic or atheist, is like not only a possible choice one could make, but like actually like a really live option. So how did we go from a, a couple millennia ago where secularity wasn't even really a live option, either being secular personally or politically really, to 
a point in history where this is a really live option and in fact is the default. So what he tries to do is offer a, a kind of explanation and the, and the kind of explanation he offers is one where the possibility for being secular arises through like a movement in the history of ideas. We can contrast this with how, say, a Marxist, for instance, might explain uh, the rise of secularism. So the Marxist uh, is, is a materialist in the sense that they want to explain the movements of history, you know, the rise and fall of empires and whatever, you know, purely in terms of you know, class struggle for material goods, for, you know, for resources, for economic resources. So the Marxists might say, well, secularism arose because people realized that it was needed in order to have a commercial society and all of that sort of thing. So really- Or alternatively that like religiosity wasn't needed. Or yeah, religiosity thing. wasn't needed, right? Like, like a purely uh, commercial society could provide all the needs people had up until you know, the rise of secularism, re uh, religious institutions provided for people's needs, but they're not they're not needed anymore. And so it goes away. So the, the Marxist is going to explain all this stuff purely in terms of economic uh, motives and, 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 and material interests. So Taylor, he acknowledges that, of course, this has to play some role, but he wants to reject the Marxist insistence on purely material explanations that he thinks ideology, that is the ideas, surely play some role in this. So, he, so he's going to be a pluralist about the explanatory mechanism. Some of it is material, that is some of it is, has to do with economic interests and whatever, but surely some of it has to do with people's ideas, their worldviews, their ideologies. Yeah, and a big part of that is that Taylor is really amenable to or sympathetic with William James, who, in his Varieties of Religious Experience, uh, which is a long-form essay of his, starts out by talking about a precondition of belief is that something is a live option for you to believe it. So, like, um, here in the West, you know, there's probably a lot of different Eastern religions or or belief, uh, belief groups or different, you know, religions in, like, Africa that we don't even know about. Or if we did know about them, they'd seem like very foreign, very strange to us. And because of this lack of familiarity, because it doesn't permeate our view of the world or our what Taylor calls social imaginary, it's not a live option for belief for us. So Taylor's really interested in this question about how secularism went from being not a live option for belief to a live option for belief that's like really in our face. It's kind of the default, um, like I was saying. Uh, and, and right, like Frank was saying, he's going to disagree with the Marxists that we can explain all of this in terms of just material conditions and class struggle for better material conditions. He's going to say, actually, like the movement of ideas that, you know, starts with the thinkers and then permeates the general public, that plays a big role, too. I think even if you are familiar with some alternative religion, it just isn't a live option for you. So as we've mentioned before... I'm always spending time with the ancient Romans, and I know a lot about the Roman, the Roman religious practices, and I'm very familiar with them. Uh, but you know, not a live option for me. You know, I can't, I can't make sacrifices to Jupiter as much as I, you know, might want to. Yeah, it's, it's uh, every, not going to work for me. Everyone who heard your really persuasive arguments for polytheism in that episode is like, they're like so disappointed. Yeah, sorry, right I, I tried. <laughs> All right, Megan, can we go back to this distinction that you made earlier on uh, when you first started talking about Taylor between like different kinds of time? So I remember this part of the book, but it was really obscure to me. I don't know if you, you've even written a bit about this. So what is this? These two kinds of time again, like what will we'll, we'll be talking about there and why does yeah, that matter? Yeah, 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 yeah. So let me let me try to let's talk about this again. So. Right. This is right at the beginning of a secular age. Taylor's talking about, you know, he's talking about ancient history. He's talking about like first century stuff. And maybe compare them to us. Like, what are we missing? Like the, the ancients had something that we don't have. Right. Like, what is that? Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot. It's it's hard to compare because I at least, uh, you know, as Taylor theorizes it, their their way of perceiving the world, which he calls the social imaginary, is radically, radically different than ours. So he has these two Cat he, he starts out with discussing these two categories. He calls it secular time and higher time. Yeah. And you brought up the seculum, secular time, the, 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 the era that we're existing in uh, right now for the, right, the seculum is kind of an, it's an era. It's a time. It's this worldly. It's this, right? It becomes a this worldly yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 right. 
Right. So the 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 saculum is is what we exist in normally from day in to day out. Um, when I go to cook a meal, or I mean, you know, okay, fine, you cook meals, but whatever. When one of us goes you, to cook you, a meal, you cook fish though. You cook the fish. Yeah. When I go to cook some fish, uh, <laughs> or you know, you go to take a shower or whatever. Th- that's all being done in the saculum. But when someone goes to mass and takes the Eucharist, for instance, yeah. or something like that, engages in some kind of religious ritual, in that instance, that's that's engaging in what Taylor would call a, a higher time. And here's a good illustration of this. Think of a Jewish family who has who engages in a Passover meal together. That's like a big thing, right? It's 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 a long ritual meal and what it's doing explicitly is hearkening back to a particular time in, you know, history or at least in the historical myth, you know, whether or not it happened, where in the, you know, the story, the angel of death passed over the houses of the Jewish people with the blood on the doorframe. Um, so that's like a really explicit way of understanding what it means to engage in a higher time. It's not really engaging in the saculum. It's it, it's in a different I don't want to say a different timeline, but it's an attempt to connect with something that's not in the saculum. Yeah, but I I guess like from the standpoint of being in the saculum, I'm in the saculum right now. We're sitting here recording this. Yeah. Isn't that just sort of like symbolic or memorial? It's not as though they're like rising up from like the current timeline to like another timeline, right? Like or 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 what? Yeah, so I think Taylor would say th- this distinction between like the symbolic and the actual wouldn't have made a lot of sense to to the ancient people who had this conception uh, that there was something real about recognizing the Passover in the sense where you're actually engaging. You're being with, transported back. You're in, you're engaging in the entirety of all of your peoples, you know, engaging in the Passover. So you're you're one with them. Uh huh. Okay. And so this is so the like so the bring this back to secularism mm-hmm. the loss of this sort of notion or well so the the important idea here is that for for the ancient mind the higher times permeated the saculum mm-hmm. there wasn't this sharp distinction and in fact through ritual through religious recognition and it through encounters with say good and evil spirits one could encounter or one one sort of like goes between both. Right. That's like a normal part of of human experience. Taylor calls this view of the self existing between the, you know, in the midst of these two different times who are sort of vulnerable to 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 shifts in the sort of way he calls that uh, a porous self. The idea of the self as as porous, as vulnerable to uh, vulnerable to like the The environment. Right. Yeah. Well, the the environment in in a in a broad sense. In contrast to what he calls the buffered self, which is, he thinks, our conception of ourselves now. So can you say a bit about that? Because that, that seems to be an, a crucial element of secularism as a kind of social imaginary. Mm-hmm. Right. So the buffered self is the term that Taylor gives to the the modern idea of the self. And by modern, I don't mean contemporary necessarily. I mean starting in uh, around the late 16th century. And uh, so we kind of see a really good picture of the modern self in the work of the philosopher Rene Descartes, who, among you know other things, spends a lot of time talking about the self as uh, something that is unable to really be affected at all by the environment. It's something that I can completely control. Uh, I can my my true self, the nugget that is me, is is spirit. Uh, it's kind of ghostly. It's it's within my body. But it can't really be affected by my body unless I let it, I guess. Um, but it's it's something that can't be like affected from physical condition, from the environment. So this idea of a buffered self, of course, you know, sort of leads naturally into what we might think of as kind of common sense, uh, or you know, might be at least our automatic picture of the, you know, if you go out and poll people on the street, they do tend to think of a human person as like in two different parts. There's like the body and the soul. Or I, the got, I got a mind and a body. A mind and a body. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, in, you know, even in philosophy, we refer to questions about, you know, the, the mental or psychic and the, and the physical as, you know, like the mind-body problem. We have these two categories. We work with them pretty fluidly. This distinction between the mind and the body, which Taylor sees as really like a, an extremely modern phenomenon, an extremely modern idea, 
is necessary groundwork for secularism, Taylor thinks, even being possible. This idea that maybe like reasoning or forming societies or whatever, that this can be done on a purely physical plane. A purely physical plane. So so can you clarify, what, what do you mean by that? Can you clarify that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So like in our, you know, day-to-day life as civilians in a city, um, we're not doing, I mean, we might do things personally religious, like we might go to church or a temple or whatever, but we're not, our, our day-to-day life, like out in the city or town or wherever we live, that's not like an explicitly religious kind of experience. So the idea is that there is like maybe the religious realm, which is private and right. personal versus, you know, the 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 worldly realm, um, which is not at all religious or spiritual. And these two are like separate things uh, kind of corresponding to the physical and the spiritual or mental or psychic or whatever you want to call it. Right. Okay. So Descartes cleaves the person into two separate spheres, right? The, the mental, spiritual, whatever, and the bodily, physical. And that's supposed to mirror the two uh, spheres of society, right? Like the kind of like religious sphere, which is private, right? And then the the, the worldly secular sphere, which is, which is uh, physical. Right? right. Yeah. I mean, as Taylor talks about it, you know, ancient religiosity, even for religions that we're really familiar with today, like Christianity... You know, this kind of private belief or like private, you know, feeling of assuredness that we're right about some, you know, some doctrine or whatever. That was like a really minimal or like completely absent part of religious life. Religious life was almost entirely about practice, yeah, about so, what you go out and right. do. Right. So it, so early Christianity, you want to say emphasize praxis, right? practice over, over credo, belief. Yeah. And this was necessary in, you know, for kind of boring reasons, because the vast majority of say Christians were illiterate. Uh, they, they, they literally couldn't read, you know, these scriptures and the sermons were not in a language they spoke. And so they, they just really didn't, they didn't know, you know, the, the, the theory behind it. They really just knew that they were supposed to go to, uh, you know, the church as much as they could and receive the Eucharist and confess the bad things they did. Yeah, right. So Megan's mentioned two elements, according to Charles Taylor, that are relevant to the rise of secularism. Two elements, I think, that don't really receive a lot of attention elsewhere. So we, we, we talked about thus far the distinction between secular time and higher time and this distinction between the, the poorest self and the buffered self. Uh, so there's one other element that's a little more familiar, I think, to the general audience for explaining the rise of secularism, and that is the Protestant Reformation. So on its surface, that sounds kind of weird, right? So how could a a movement in the history of a particular religion lead to secularism? But this is actually a pretty popular thesis. So I think yeah, it's not new to Taylor. Not new to Taylor. Max Weber is uh, he's the guy who's known for kind of I mean coming up with this idea, which is pretty widely accepted as far as I know. Yeah. So so Taylor relies pretty heavily on, on Weber here. And so how is the Reformation relevant to secularism? Well, uh, the Protestant Reformation rejected any sort of notion of like a of a, like a, an otherworldly spiritual vocation that is for a select few, things like extremist forms of asceticism or, or monasticism. And these were uh, integral parts of Catholic Christianity for centuries. So or the, the Protestant Reformation rejected this sort of thing. Uh, they rejected, they were kind of skeptical of religious authority. So they still had priests, but they were, skepti- they were skeptical that the religious authority should play, a, I don't know, like a, a, a super important role in people's lives. Yeah, I mean, Martin Luther himself was a monk who ceased to be a monk uh, after his 95 theses and, in fact, married a former nun. And it, it wasn't as though, like, in the entirety of the Protestant Reformation, all forms of, um, like, asceticism or monasticism were eschewed. Like, people still saw them as good, but they saw them as goods commensurate with, you know, a married life of working on a farm or something, that they're, like, completely equal rather than one of them being uh, a higher calling. Yeah, so you can live like a, a fully, entirely Christian life doing like this worldly thing. And you right. would be doing something just as good as like the Virgin Mary did. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, this sort of leads to a kind of collapse of the distinction between, at least according to Taylor, the distinction between 
the sacred and the profane. Right? So like Catholicism, at least historically, put a lot of emphasis on things like relics. People would go to the Middle East or the Holy Land to try to find shards of the of the the true cross or this the, the spear that pierced Christ or uh you know even like the pieces of like bones of saints the finger bone yeah. of, like some martyr yeah. or something yeah and yeah. every and every every cathedral like had its own relics right like here these are the relics of our cathedral a lot of them still do yeah and this is all super important for Catholicism and this is totally done away with by Protestantism like they're very very skeptical of things like relics and in and, fact that kind of thing I think is seen as I don't know if I want to say goofy but like it's sort of like looked down on as you know worshiping what's ordinary yeah, yeah. what did the reformers think uh the Catholics were doing I thought they thought they were worshiping the the, yeah. the, the, the bread and the Eucharist right mm -hmm. So, yeah, so the Protestantism kind of almost counterintuitively leads to a kind of, at least according to Taylor and people like Weber, a kind of a disenchantment of the world. Yeah, that's his term. Yes. That's, that's Weber's term. And a kind of like this destruction of the distinction between the sacred and the profane. There really is not a sacred domain anymore, at least in the sense in which there was in Catholic Christianity. And I mean, I think charitably, the goal was to make... Um, you know, make everything sacred, you know, like the, the initial, I think, Protestant idea was that like, oh, there is like this like spiritual nobility and just like being, you know, ha being like a humble farmer and working hard. Right. Right. This is, this is ba the title of Weber's book is Protestant ethic and the Protestant ethic and the spirit, yeah. and the spirit mm -hmm. of capitalism. He thought Protestantism also pl played a role in the construction of uh, commercial society modern and, day and, and modern day capitalism right so these that's connected to that sort of thing yeah because the idea is that there is uh, you know the 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 charitable reading of this is that there is a kind of spiritual importance about you know the the very humble life and and so then the the catholic emphasis on these higher callings that are you know and and emphasis on like adoration yeah. of the host and stuff like that that's seen as like you know maybe prideful vanity yeah, yeah I, I guess in catholic christianity the monks were thought to be closer to God than the ordinary person, right? oh, right. and, that, and that's why the ordinary people would maintain the livelihood of the monks. They were they were closer to God than than us ordinary. So people. they were praying for the people yeah. Yeah. At, like all day long, right? But but the result of this isn't that everything was made more sacred, but that but everything was rendered less sacred, yeah. at least according to Taylor and Weber. And I guess uh, some modern day Catholics, right? Because there are some modern day Catholics that will blame the Protestant Reformation for what they view as an increasingly secular society, and uh, which is a, a pejorative for them, right? Yeah. So, I mean, Taylor's a Catholic. And I mean, I think he sees the story as complicated, but definitely sees the Protestant Reformation as really accelerating the the current situation that we're in. And a result of that has been that recently, so earlier Frank was saying that it's kind of that most of the political philosophy for the last you know, several centuries has been intramural debate among people assuming a kind of political secularism, uh, assuming a kind of uh, state neutrality, uh, at least that that's like an, an inoptimal place to end up, starting from maybe John Locke. Yeah, Locke, uh, like the Locke, for instance, divides, uh, you know, our society into a religious society, which is private and civil society, which is public, you know, rel the religious realm. De uh, deals with your happiness in the other world and the, the civil realm deals with your happiness in this world. Nair should these two meet. Nair should these two meet. Completely yes. separate. Right, right, right. And then, you know, yeah, from there on out in Western thought, the, the presumption by the majority has been that this is the ideal. This is what we want to avoid these kinds of wars of religion and unnecessary infighting. But recently, <laughs> this has not been the case. So there has been a handful of I guess, work that's gotten a lot of attention in, you know, Western philosophical thought in the last couple of decades that is considered what's called like post-liberal political philosophy of thinkers. And they're often, almost all the time, they're religious, most of the time Catholic, although not entirely, philosophers and political theorists who think you know, actually, secular liberalism and liberalism used in the in the you know the gen the general sense the we general said sense. earlier, where it's like just the idea that freedom's valuable. Like we start with freedom; individuals are free and equal, and if the state is going to infringe on their freedom, they need a very good reason to do so. The default is freedom. The state ought to be neutral with respect to you know religious worldviews and just sort of kind of manage things so that everything's stable and ordinary or orderly, and the economy flourishes and whatever. Yeah, so this handful of thinkers, maybe more than a handful, 
post liberals say, well, you know, that sounds nice, but it would never work. Or I mean, some of them actually don't even think that sounds nice. Yeah. Um, but think, you know, we we've tried liberalism and at least, you know, by their estimation of uh, this has failed, um, that it's not actually good, not just for like society at large, but even for the individuals in it. Um, that maybe the freedom that people think they have is kind of illusory, that they're not actually um, free to practice their religion or whatever um, they, they think they are because there's no one forcing them to do thus and so. But maybe like maybe we need the state kind of like telling us what to do or guiding us into a certain worldview or religion. And that kind of without that, we lack a sort of um, we lack an important kind of freedom to become good. So the, the post liberal thinks that yeah, secularism is good for the irreligious, but it's a raw deal for the religious. Right, right. Good for the irreligious, bad for the religious. And so who are these thinkers that you uh, alluded to? Although we should, act, we should clarify, the the post-liberal thinks that secularism will seem good to the irreligious. Oh, right, right, right. right. Actually, right. the irreligious yeah. would be Right, so the, the, yeah, that's right. So the, 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 the irreligious think they're flourishing, but they're not actually. Yeah, at least for the, for the religious post-liberal. Not all post-liberals are religious like i mean you could call michael sandel a kind of he's a communitarian i don't think he's religious yeah um but who are they yeah so i mean i guess in philosophy proper probably the earliest most popular case of it would be alistair mcintyre right um who began his philosophical career as a marxist and has ended i don't want to say ended because he's still alive and writing stuff has come to the point <laughs> Um, uh, he, he is now, he is a Catholic, uh, an Irish Catholic, I believe. Someone's going to correct me on that in the comments, I know. Um, uh, and he's a communitarian. So he, I think in, philo in, you know, philosophy, he's, he kind of got the ball rolling a, a while ago in like the eighties or when was after virtue written? He was Scottish by the way. Oh gosh. <laughs> Close enough. Uh, 81, 81. 81. Okay. Yeah. So in the eighties. But in more popular press, so outside of philosophy, I think a lot of this gets started with a guy named Rod Dreher, who a lot of you will know as being the person who runs the American conservative blog, although he does not live in America any longer, but he still writes for the American conservative, I guess because he is American I and mean, he doesn't live in America anymore. But Rod Dreher, he came out with this book, um, Frank, you should look this up what year it came out, The Benedict Option. The Benedict Option was kind of the first like book that I know of that became really popular that sort of looked askance at liberalism. And while it didn't advocate for like changing the government, it did advocate that Christians specifically should like go and live in communities, you know, by themselves, like specifically Christian communities, sort of like as the Amish do, but not necessarily in an Amish lifestyle. He is He's Orthodox, I believe. So it was, uh, came out in 2017, and it is supposed to be influenced by uh, Benedictine monks. Yes, right? that's sense. right. Uh, Which and, is funny because Dreher's not a Catholic, yeah. and he wasn't a Catholic when he wrote that. But and, right. influenced, and influenced by McIntyre. Yes, that's right. That's right. So that's the first one that I remember thinking really made some waves. But of course, it wasn't exactly post-liberalism because he didn't really advocate trying to change the government. But now you have people coming along like Patrick Deenan and Adrian Vermuli. Verm yeah, Harvard Law Professor. Yeah, is it Vermuli or Vermule? I'm going to go with Muley. Yeah, I think that's right. And they're post-liberal in uh, in a much more explicit sense, where they think that the, the project of liberalism in political philosophy has failed, that it's demonstrably failed, uh, and that we need to replace it with a political, with a, with a regime, a government, that is based on what John Rawls, another political philosopher, would call a comprehensive doctrine of the good. And interestingly, post-liberalism, so probably a lot of our listeners know this, that there has been like a real rise in what might be called like influencers, like far right influencers who are sort of like explicitly advocating for nationalism. And the interesting thing about what we're seeing in a lot of these people, like um, people like Nick Fuentes or something, mm -hmm is that they will use explicitly religious concepts, like explicitly Christian concepts and language, and in fact advocate for like a Christian nationalism society. But they are not religious. So they're still in the seculum, right? So they, they it, so, it seems like they're violating secularism, but at least from like the way Taylor thinks about this, right? This is still very this worldly. 
kind of paradoxical. Yeah, I mean, it's it's right. It, well, I'm and it's even bringing, or it's bringing religion into the saculum in like this really explicit way, where it's like totally drained of all of what Taylor would call like the enchantment, and it's purely utilitarian with maybe like some maybe they like the aesthetic as well or something yeah. or they often they'll say stuff like well we need that as like a common moral grounds mm -hmm. yeah and this is also happening in india and i don't know a ton about this um but i do know that india is seeing a rise in hindu nationalism mm -hmm. and that this has been going on for a while but we see a similar phenomenon there where the, the hindu nationalists are anti-liberals but weirdly, a lot of the leaders of these movements are not actually religious. So like one really popular one is explicitly uh, he, he like eats beef and is not does not seem to be religious in any way, but kind of co-ops like this religious imagery or these concepts to, I guess, maybe like gain followers or maybe. I, maybe Does he like the values of Hinduism? I think so. Yeah, I think he sees it as like a common, maybe like a common past to draw everyone together um like a like an umbrella so I guess, yeah i guess the idea is like okay with like this kind of rootless this kind of like traditionless society is not viable we need some kind of tradition whatever it is i need something right we need something and, and it's and it's weird that a lot of the contemporary nas uh, religious nationalist movements uh seem like Th this need can be completely separated from whether or not the actual tenets are true. Interesting. So it seems like this is some somewhat of a global phenomenon. I mean, we're out of our depths here, right? Sort of wildly out of. Yeah, our this depth. is this is uh, you know contemporary religious studies, political theology, whatever. We're we're out of our depths, but it does seem like these challenges to secularism, these challenges to this the previous liberal consensus. Uh, this does seem to be a kind of global phenomenon. Yeah, but it's a challenge to secularism from the saculum, which is itself very strange. So Megan has some data. I, if you recall, in our first episode, I said we like to be empirically informed here on philosophy on the fringes, at least insofar as that is possible. Uh, so what's this data you have here, Megan? Yeah, so there's a lot of really interesting data. I'm just going to be talking about America right now. So, I mean, United States, um, because there's too much data to do anything else. Um, it, but uh, we hear like all I feel like everyone hears all the time. Oh, the number of religiously unaffiliated people is increasing. Mm -hmm, yeah, this is true. It has slowed down the rate of increase in the last couple of years, but it's still raising uh, rising pretty steadily. So as of like six months ago was the most recent Gallup poll on this around 21 percent of Americans identify as a quote unquote religious nun, which is that they're not affiliated with any particular religion. Um, 21%. And this, I mean, to put this in perspective, in the 1950s, this was like 2% of yeah. people. So it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big increase. And it, and on top of that, the people who identify as religious nuns are that category is not only growing, they're also, at least according to uh, the Pew Research Center polls, they're becoming more, and they use this word, secular. So, for instance, uh, when asked how important is religion, so these are all people who identify as religious nuns. When asked how important is religion in your life, uh, the number of people, the, the number of religious nuns who said none at all has gone up to 65 percent from 57 uh, percent in the last few years. And... When asked, how often do you pray? 62% say never, up from a few years ago where it was 56%. So I'm not going to go through all the minutia of this, but 21% religious nuns and the nuns, you know, maybe several years ago, the religious nuns were still like kind of religious, even if they didn't fit neatly into any particular religious box. But now it seems like they're becoming less religious. So that's all interesting, but there's some um, there's some interesting data from the other direction, too. So as of 2009, that's not very recent data, but this is the most recent that this poll has ever been done. Um, so poll was done in 2009. Have you ever had a religious or mystical experience? And the number in 2009 was 49% of people said yes. Now, this is interesting because in 1962, what percentage of people do you think said yes? Just take a guess. 68. No. 22. So less than Way less. 22 in our, our so-called secular age. Yeah. 22% of people in 1962 had had a religious or mystical experience versus 49% mm -hmm. in 2009. 
Yeah, that's weird. That is puzzling. That is extremely puzzling, especially since almost everyone in the U.S. identified as religious in 19, in the 1960s still. So that's interesting. Additionally, loads and loads of people hold at least one New Age belief. And this is from 2018. But um, people were polled on whether they believed in at least one of these things. They were asked about belief in reincarnation, astrology, psychics, and the presence of spiritual energy in physical objects. And so many people did believe in at least one of these. So let me give you some interesting numbers. Mainline Protestants, we have 57% of them say, yes, I believe in at least one of those. Catholics, Uh, 70% believe in at least one of those. Those are both kind of interesting because those are considered like new agey beliefs that aren't really part of like traditional Christianity. But here's the interesting part. Unaffiliated people to religious nuns, 62% believe in at least one of those. Atheists, only 22%. Agnostics, 56%. And people who identify as nothing in particular, 78% believe in at least one of those things. That's the highest category of everyone. So, you know, there's like that people always, you know, you always hear people say, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. But like this is a hugely increasing category. Right. So it seems like the religious impulse might still be with us, even if even society is more secular. Or something. Yeah, or, but, I mean, it, or it's being sublimated in certain other ways or something. Yeah. Like people definitely are still experiencing, you know, some kind of what Taylor might call enchantment uh, of the world, even if they won't like, even if they don't think like the appropriate response to that is like acknowledging it through a religion. Yeah, I sort of thought about this a a bit while I was reading Taylor. Uh, Although I found a lot of his analysis compelling, I I still, uh, there's this nagging thought I had. It just seems to me that people still are believing, yeah, believe in this kind of like kind of magical things. Like, is the world really as disenchanted as these great 20th and 21st century theorists say? I don't know. Well, I mean, yeah, so... Taylor has some stuff to say about this. I mean, I guess, you know, we don't have enough time for me to really say exactly what he says about this. But I think he'd say something confusing like, yeah, it's it's a particular kind of like secular enchantment Mm -hmm. that's just like, you know, completely different. Right. Because like, uh, so for instance, take the the case of manifesting, right? So manifesting is this idea that you like just believe or want something really, really hard and imagine that you have the thing eventually the universe will give you the thing. Also known as the secret yeah. or lucky girl syndrome. Yeah, just uh, wild yeah. stuff. I saw I saw an article, a psych article posted on Twitter recently, which said that uh, like 30% of people surveyed believe this kind of stuff. That's right? absolutely incredible. Yeah, so that's crazy. This is this is sort of, yeah, it's, it's all it's all very this worldly type stuff. So uh, yeah, it, it, does, it does seem to be, perhaps that's what Taylor could say, that it is, it is still, you know, in the saculum, as it were. Yeah, I think he would say that. Like, there's something really interesting about, you know, the kind of spirituality that we see in, you know, religious nuns who, like, have experiences with ghosts or something. That It's, like, really, it, it couldn't exist anywhere but, like, the modern era. Religious nuns as in N-O-N-E-S. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, gosh, I, yeah, religious, yeah, unreligious people, not, like, actual, like, nuns, yeah. like, in an abbey, right? <laughs> And that's all the time we have for today's episode. Join us next time where we're going to sit back, have a drink, and talk about alcohol. Or two. Maybe two drinks. 